you all. Today we have very great privilege to have Dr. Athar Ali uh, sir with us. He earned his PhD from Department of Computer Science, Law Park University, UK, and his Bachelor and Master degree in Computer Engineering from Department of Computer Engineering, Aligarh Muslim University. Prior to joining the Department of Applied Computing at the University of Buckingham, he worked as an associate professor at the Department of Computer Engineering, Aligarh Muslim University, and as a research associate at Lobok University. His research interests include image and video coding, multimedia information security, system engineering, system of uh, systems, and machine learning. Today's survey and lighting is upon the system security parameters on the medical image processing. Now I request sir to take over the session and enlighten us with your great knowledge and experience. Sir, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Vishal. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Vishal mentioned, my name is Atha. Uh, I am a lecturer at the School of Computing at the University of Buckingham in the United Kingdom. Uh, so as Dr. Vishal pointed out, uh, my research area is quite broad. It covers areas from uh, image processing, video coding, video processing, information security, um, and also recently also into uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, and broadly artificial intelligence. Uh, so today I will be talking about uh, data protection techniques and other surrounding issues particularly for medical images. Uh, so let me start off by sharing my uh, presentation. And please let me know if there are any issues uh, with viewing my presentation. Uh, so uh, Dr. Bashar, can you please confirm, are you able to see my presentation? Yes, sir, PPT is coming, sir. So you, okay. can, do, you can do one thing, you can please open the chat window in your right or left corner. So that okay. you can interact with the participants. So the Next. chat window is available at the top. There are oh, six yeah. small circles. Uh, and there is a mic camera sharing. Uh, and there, yes. is, so yeah. there is a but fifth then, option is chat. Uh, OK. So uh, is that called, but it says it's called private chat. Start private chat with this participant. So is that what so I So you just click, click on the chat. OK. So in the so, chat, now there is a, at the right side, you will get a chat window. So I'm trying to send you a message now, Dr. Vishal. Yes, sir, please. Did you get that? No. I think you have selected to any particular one. After okay, I'm, I'm trying to see, message. I'm trying to see, uh, because what it is doing is that it is showing me. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir, in which you have checked now that there is option at to everyone. Okay, there is I'm a one drop out menu. Drop down okay. menu there is. At uh -huh. Everyone. I have just a text a message, sir. Hi. Uh, let me see. I may probably have to go back to. Should I, should I stop sharing my screen first? No, no, without sharing, you can also see the chat. Because uh, in it's, it's showing me grid view, then it's showing me... So you please, uh, just please cl click on the stop sharing, then you will okay. get the uh, option of uh, chat. Let's then after see. we will share again. Because I think I am, I am uh, actually using uh, uh, an Apple platform. It may be slightly different on this. Yeah, there is slight difference in all the uh, software, so that Google, Zoom, please. Mm, there, I think so. Because uh, I'm trying to see if there is any option where it can allow me to... Also, I'm, I'm trying to struggle with... Uh, okay, I've got it now. Okay, uh, I think I found it because for me, it's coming out as a pop-out window separately. So I think I was able to see that. So if I close this... And I close the participant list. So on the top, it says participants. Sir, uh, and there is you a have clicked on the participants. participants. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So now I can see that window, and I've got I've got uh, a lot of uh, messages from. Okay, yes. I may try to see if I can read. I've got it from um, Dr. Avinash, uh, Ms. Neha. Uh, I've got think I've got it from Ms. Varisha, Jyoti. Uh, so I think I can see all the messages. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. 
Some, uh, no, it is. I, I think it is okay, Dr. Athar. You may start. Okay. Uh, just uh, put your uh, presentation in slideshow. Okay. Let's see if I can do that. How is that? So I, I'm not sure whether the chat window will always be visible. Are you able to see my uh, title screen? Anyway, Dr. Vishal, what you can do, you can keep track of important questions which uh, participants are asking and uh, writing in chat window. Yes, sir. And towards the end of the lecture, you can remind, sir, uh, those questions, so he will take it up. Yes, sir, we can do, sir. Okay, so let him, let him complete his lecture. So uh, are you able to see my first uh, slide? Yes, oh, sir. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. So let me again restart. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone uh, back in India. Uh, so as you can see, my name is Arthur. Uh, I'm at the School of Computing at the University of Buckingham, and uh, I will be talking about uh, data protection techniques for medical images. Uh, so let me start off by showing you the outline. So the outline, I'll start off with the background, talking about uh, what are the security issues uh, surrounding medical images. We'll take a look at the infrastructure, uh, which is normally used in medical systems worldwide quickly dip into talking about the threat model. So we'll take a look at what the threat model is in terms of what are the different kinds of attacks uh, that are usually launched on medical systems and uh, what are the different kinds of approaches that attackers usually take uh, to breach medical systems. Then we'll take a look at some of the security models that are currently in practice today worldwide. Uh, but then, obviously, these security models have flaws, and that, that is the reason why you have these attacks still taking place on medical systems worldwide. So we'll take a look at some of the attack vectors. Uh, that attack vectors will describe basically some of the most popular approaches that uh, attackers usually take in order to breach uh, secure medical systems. Then we'll take a look at some of the protection mechanisms that are used within these security models to enforce protection of medical systems, particularly for images. And we'll end up by taking a look at, um, at some case studies, uh, which are fairly recent and uh, that have happened in different countries around the world in terms of breaches of medical data. So start off with the background. So if we take a look at the usage of medical imaging worldwide, everyone can agree that uh, there has been uh, an year-on-year -year increase in the usage of uh, medical imaging techniques for diagnostics. And as you can see here, so this is the data which is usually used in England. So in England, uh, there is something called as a national health service. And this is an overarching body that controls health services all over the United Kingdom. So particularly for England, if you look at the data for March 2018 to March 2019, you can see that uh, the number of procedures that are usually done on an annual basis. As you can see for x-rays, it's about hovering around the 2 million mark. So that's the number of x-rays that happen annually. And similarly, you can have slightly lower figures for ultrasounds, uh, CT scans, and MRI scans. Of course, this data is provisional. It has not been validated yet. Uh, but nonetheless, the validation will not vary significantly from this trend that is being shown here. So everyone can see that Medical imaging is now one of the foremost diagnostic approaches that are actually used, uh, not just within UK, but all over the world. So obviously, it means that each of these x-rays is a personal data for a patient. Each of these ultrasounds, the CT scans, these MRI scans, all of these are personal data pertaining to individual patients. And obviously, they need to be protected. However, we cannot also deny that there is an ever-growing risk of this medical information being disclosed or revealed to an unauthorized third party. Now, there could be any number of third parties. We'll talk about that later. But any third party other than the consultant, the doctor, and the patient, uh, any entity other than these two will be a third party. And if they are unauthorized, there's always a risk that this information would be revealed or disclosed to them in an unauthorized manner. Experian now is a, is a data management company. It handles different kinds of data on a global basis. And it has found out that once a patient's medical records are actually stolen, then they can be easily sold for anywhere up to $1,000. Now, once these uh, pieces of information regarding personal 
medical information of a patient are revealed, now the number of consequences that can emanate from that is practically limitless. So in the best case scenario, what you would have is minor annoyances with targeted unsolicited advertising, advertising uh, drugs and cures and whatnot. But on the worst case scenario, it could be much worse. It could be borderline criminal in the sense that it could be leading to identity theft where your identities could be stolen. It could lead to blackmail, tax fraud, and home equity loan fraud. The last two are very popularly sort of uh, cases that you would find especially uh, in the United States. So tax fraud and loan fraud for home loans is something which is fairly common, uh, which can emanate from medical data being stolen off patients in the, in, the, in the US. So therefore, it means that it could be anywhere from annoyances to uh, quite serious criminal offenses really. So therefore, as you see here, there is really no shortage of these kind of uh, scary news that you can see uh, all over the world. So you can see I've pulled up these uh, newspaper clippings from all over the world where you can see to an amount where a billion medical records have been stolen. Uh, and these includes images as well. So it's a very scary scenario. And uh, you will see that now the situation is that medical data is one of the most commonly breached uh, pieces of information online. So the most valuable and the most vulnerable piece of information that is now stolen these days is of patients and their corresponding medical records. However, we cannot deny that we are more and more dependent on medical images for diagnostics, and it is becoming increasingly important. Now, obviously, to have these medical images uh, being taken by these medical imaging devices, they need to be sent across from one system to another, and therefore, they need a network, they need a computer network. Now, we cannot really construct an isolated separate network just for these medical imaging systems and these medical imaging devices. Therefore, they have to make use of public networks such as the internet. That is really inevitable, that is unavoidable. Nothing can be done about it. So we are, what we have to do is we have to think about using existing networks and then try to have some sort of security mechanism enforced while using those public networks. So in order to take care of this possibility, of this uh, eventuality, which is really inevitable, uh, every country, almost every country all over the world have come up with legal and ethical frameworks uh, that are designed to protect the privacy and confidentiality of patient information. Uh, as you can see here, in the US, you have something called as the HIPAA, which came in 1996. In the UK and in Europe, you have something called as the GDPR which is basically a refinement of a Data Protection Act. And this was refined in 2018 to now much more exclusively cover medical imaging device, uh, data as well. And in India, you now have uh, something called as the Personal Data Protection Bill, which has been tabled in the parliament in 2019. It has not been ratified yet, so it is still an ongoing process, but uh, even India now is uh, sort of keenly looking at coming up with some sort of a legal framework which will protect uh, the information of uh, patients. So we can talk about the threat possibilities. So what are the different possible outcomes that may happen as a result of medical imaging data being stolen? So all of these are some of the consequences. So the threats that you may possibly get out of medical imaging data being stolen is, it can simply be unauthorized access, so someone is just uh, sort of snooping on someone's uh, medical imaging data. It could be disclosed to a third party. It could be modified to even say, for example, remove critical uh, evidence which may be required in a court of law. It could simply be deleted uh, as a prank. Uh, it could be sold off on the dark web, which could lead to further consequences such as uh, blackmail and so on, fraud, identity theft, uh, ransomware, uh, we'll talk particularly about ransomware. This is again something fairly recent as a threat that has come up, uh, wherein people try to steal off your data and then demand money in return. And the list of attacks really goes on. So that's why I've written here as an et cetera, because really 
attackers are coming up with newer and newer threat possibilities for medical imaging data. Okay, so now let's take a look at the infrastructure. Uh, so this is a very simplified model of the infrastructure that we use. Uh, MICS stands for Medical Imaging Cyber Physical Systems. So it's a cyber physical system in the sense that you have to make use of these physical components in this network, as well as use the public network in order to make these devices communicate or talk to each other. So if you look here, so here's a medical imaging device. Uh, once the diagnostics of a patient are run, they will be transferred onto something known as a PAX slash RIS. I'll talk about this in the next slide. Uh, and from there on out, it could even be transmitted onto a doctor or a client's workstation. And you can see that these arrows are bidirectional, therefore the data can flow either way. Now, usually, the communication between these components are based on a VPN. VPN is for uh, a virtual private network, which means that it is a sort of an enforcement policy where all the communication that happens between these components is essentially kept private and secure as a result of the VPN connection. Uh, also, these devices, uh, these actual medical diagnostic devices, they are controlled remotely. So uh, there is no, there's no need for an operator to be physically in contact with the diagnostic device. These diagnostic devices can be controlled remotely over even a network to perform the diagnostic process. So therefore, even this control has to be done over a secure connection. So once we understand these are the three basic elements of uh, any MICPS, uh, there's nothing much to discuss in terms of an imaging device. So we can have things like X-rays, CT scans, uh, CAT scans, bone scans, uh, MRIs, all of these are the de devices. We'll quickly take a look at PACs and RIS, and I'll also take a look at the standard imaging format that is used in medical imaging systems uh, worldwide. So if we start from the left-hand side, and this is what a PAX is. So PAX is basically a picture archive and a communication system. If you focus on this diagram here, you will see that all of the diagnostic devices are connected via a secure LAN to a PAX. So PAX basically is an infrastructure that has been developed mainly to handle, transmit, and store medical images. Uh, as you can see here, any images that have been sort of generated by these imaging devices, they are sent onto a PAX server. And then from there on out, it could be sent across a LAN to some PAX clients, and it can also be sent across the internet to some PAX clients remotely on the other side of the world. So basically, this infrastructure has been set up only to handle, transmit, and store medical imaging devices. On the other hand, you have something called as the RISC. Now, this is a software solution. So what this does is that it sort of automates the workflow of the transmission of information from medical imaging devices to the corresponding clients. And these could be doctor workstations or even uh, patients and devices. And it will also enable any flow of information from these PAC clients back into the PAC. So for example, if an image has been picked, uh, has been generated, let's say by an MRI device, it comes and sits in the PAC server. And then from here on out, it would be sent to uh, maybe a doctor's workstation. So a, a doctor's workstation could be a PAC client. And then once the doctor has uh, performed the diagnostics, then that result could be sent back and stored into the PAC server. And then from the PAC server, it can then be sent remotely over to the patient. So all of this workflow is handled by the RIS or the radiographic information system. So this software basically runs on top of the packs. So usually you will have the packs and the RIS bundled together. So this is the hardware infrastructure that has been set up and that's the software workflow that will run on top of this infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to images, the actual images that are generated, now what has happened is that the medical community have agreed on a standard imaging format called DICOM. The DICOM is a standard imaging format that is used for medical images. And uh, here, what has been agreed upon is that all of the different kinds of imaging devices, whether they be X-rays or MRIs or CAT scans, they will all generate their images in the DICOM format. 
Now the DICOM format is interoperable. So it means that an image that has been generated by one manufacturer can be processed, edited, and looked at by the device of, of another manufacturer. So it is basically interoperable in nature as well. Okay. Uh, so with this standardization, it, it has been made seamless that medical images would flow without any format conversion, any compression, or uh, any other changes being made to the image itself when it moves from one system to the other. So it's basically a standardization process. So normally every medical imaging device that is manufactured will have to conform to the DICOM standard. And we'll see later why this is a very beneficial approach. Now, when it comes to security measures, whether you talk about the PACS or the RIS or the DICOM, they will all have to have some security measures being put in place. And it could be one or a combination of these four. So it could be an encrypted transmission. So therefore, any transmission that happens within the PACS is encrypted. You will have firewalls, which will protect the PACS and the RIS. Uh, password management, you could have possibilities where every DICOM image is protected by a password. And obviously, any storage and archival that has to happen within the PAX risk system has to be secured as well. So these four broad security measures will have to be in place whenever you talk about a medical imaging system or an MICPS, which has these three elements inside it. So we'll take a look at these four aspects uh, in a little bit more detail later. So let's take a look at the threat model first. Uh, what is a threat model actually in terms of these modern physical systems? Uh, so when you talk about the classification tree, you can have the data leakage for medical images happening in either one of the two possibilities. So it could be an intentional threat, so where there is an, a clear intention to steal and leak medical imaging data. And sometimes it could really be a silly mistake. So therefore, we have something called inadvertent threats. So once we make this clear distinction between the two possibilities in terms of the leakage, uh, we can further now have a look at then what would be the players who would actually give rise to these threats. So you can have any of these tools being deployed as a result of the intentional threats. You can have malware, uh, et cetera, Trojans, uh, social engineering. So all of these are threats which are external in nature. So what we're trying to understand here is that these intentional threats which can take place via these tools right here would be actually deployed by someone who is external to the system or the organization where the medical imaging system is. So it could be an external uh, entity who's trying to gain access to a medical imaging system secured within a network. However, there have been cases where the threat has actually emanated from inside an organization. So where uh, it could be uh, an insider player, such as, for example, an employee or even a third party entity which has access to those medical imaging devices, which has lawfully gained access to the network where the medical imaging system is, and then has carried out an attack from inside the network. In those cases, we call that as an insider attack. So again, in this case, this attack could actually either be intentional or it could be inadvertent or unintentional. Uh, so you can have situations where uh, a third party accidentally uh, publishes some confidential medical imaging data and so on. It could also be due to things like improper encryption, a computer has simply been lost, a drive has been lost, a DVD ROM which had medical images is simply dropped or lost by someone. It could, it could be intentional as well. Again, in this case, it could be privileged abuse. So here what happened was that you have a privilege to access medical imaging data and you went ahead and abused that privilege in an, in an unintentional manner. So once we have this classification with us, we can actually name these uh, threats as a masquerader. So what, what we do is that if you have external threats and these uh, attackers have a clear intention of breaching this medical imaging data, we term them as masqueraders. If it is an internal attack, and the attacker is internal to the network or the organization and has a clear intention of launching an attack. We call such users as clandestine users. Whereas if particularly for the case of privileged abuse, I mean, for the others, you can simply call them to be careless users. 
or a careless uh, sort of say mechanism wherein either data was transmitted or archived or displayed. So that's simply an inadvertent mistake or an error. But particularly for the case of privilege abuse, we term these kind of attacks as a misfeasor. So by looking at this classification tree of different kinds of attacks and the attack players that are usually involved, it gives us a very clear handle on uh, how we can identify and manage these attacks should they happen. So let's take a look at the security models. So once we understand what the threat model is, let's take a look at the security model. So we'll start off by the legal framework. So particularly in the case of the UK, the law, and of course, uh, the GDPR law, which is applicable in the European Union and the UK, uh, it's not at all that different from the HIPAA or the uh, data protection uh, bill that has been tabled in India, because they more or less address the same issue, wherein that they clearly say that all healthcare organizations have to take adequate data protection measures to protect sensitive and personal information of all of their patients. And this is how it starts off, but then some laws, they are very specific in how this should be enforced. So for example, if you look at GDPR, then it has three broad avenues where they demand that all hospitals, all medical uh, related organizations which deal with hospitals have to take adequate measures to protect uh, sensitive and personal information. And that is to do with these three. The first one is not really relevant to us, so I've highlighted it in a different color because we're not really dealing with reliability here. This is a reliability issue. But the next two are the ones that we'll focus on. So how do we physically protect the main server, so the main pack server within a hospital or uh, a, a related organization has to have appropriate measures deployed to physically protect the main server from only allowing access to authorized users. Uh, and the next one is why we are sort of more involved in, which is to do with how is the data stored, how is it transmitted, and which users are allowed access to this data. So we'll only take a look at the uh, last two avenues for protection. The first one is really not relevant uh, and beyond the scope of this uh, talk here. So when you talk about the last two aspects, they are actually handled by something known as the CIA triad. CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are the three aspects that are to be addressed in the last two requirements that have been laid out within the GDPR legal framework. And as you can see here, uh, what is happening is that in terms of confidentiality, you have to ensure that data is protected from unauthorized access and disclosure. Uh, data has to be protected when it is in transit, when it is archived, when it is displayed, uh, all of that. Then when it comes to availability, you have to make sure that the data is only available to authorized personnel. Uh, there is an acceptable level of performance in terms of not having uh, unacceptable delays and loss of information. You have to think about aspects to do with fault tolerance, reliable backups uh, to prevent any uh, loss or destruction of data, any, any sort of say unwanted alteration of data. Integrity has to do with Things like, again, you have to ensure that the data is consistent. In, uh, the, the data being consistent, meaning that when the data was generated to the time when it is actually either di uh, diagnosed or analyzed or transmitted, there should be no change in the data from the form that it was actually captured in. So as long as that is ensured, the data is supposed to be integral or consistent in nature. So these are the three arms of the CIA triad that must be satisfied in order to satisfy the legal requirements under GDPR in the UK, HIPAA in the US, and also the uh, Personal Data Act that is uh, about to be launched in India. So if you look at the attack vectors now, so what are the different avenues and the different ap approaches that are taken by attackers to uh, sort of steal medical imaging data? There are two approaches that they are taken. So the attack vector could be external in nature, which, is, which, is, uh, which means that the attacker clearly outside the network of the organization or the hospital that he is planning to steal data from. And the other one obviously will be 
the internal approach. So we'll take a look at that uh, after this. So when we talk about the external approach, there are three broad methods of attacks that are usually taken by external players. So it is to do with remote server poisoning. It could be an internal network penetration and physical brute force. We'll take them one by one. When we talk about remote server poisoning, so this is to do with the fact that all of the medical imaging devices that are in use today will, in one way or the other, be connected to the manufacturer's server. And that is essential because then the manufacturer can perform diagnostics remotely, they can perform updates remotely. So therefore, it is a necessity that every time there is a constant connection between a medical imaging device and the manufacturer's server. Now, even though attempts have been made to make this connection via VPN, however, the manufacturers' servers themselves are sometimes not that secure. So to gain access to a medical imaging device, what the attackers usually do is that they try to break into the manufacturer's server first, and from there on out, piggyback on the VPN connection of that compromised server with the medical imaging device and thereby gain access to it. And once access is made to a medical imaging device via this mode, then the attackers can push in any kind of malware, Trojan horse, and they can start sniffing the network traffic. They can even remotely start controlling the medical imaging device such that the medical imaging device starts transmitting whatever information it generates in terms of images and patient data directly to their machines rather than to the manufacturer's server. So in a way, this is basically a compromise of the manufacturer's server, which allows attackers to gain access to the medical imaging device itself, and then try to control it remotely. So this is, an, this is a scenario where the uh, connection between the medical imaging device and the manufacturer's server itself is not compromised, but the server is. So this is a very a difficult attack to predict and also to manage and prevent because it is now the responsibility of the manufacturers themselves to make sure that the server is secure enough. It is not a fault or a weak link in terms of the connection between the server and the medical imaging device. It is the server which is the weak point. They talk about internal network protection. Now this is something which is again uh, very much unavoidable in the sense that when you go to a hospital, when you go to a medical organization, they usually offer public Wi-Fi. Now we all know that public Wi-Fi are extremely insecure. Uh, they do not perform any sort of authentication whatsoever in terms of allowing users to log on. So an external attacker would simply walk into a hospital, log on to the public Wi-Fi, and once they have got access to the public Wi-Fi, then the next step would be that they would start performing something called as port scanning. Now, herein, what they're trying to do is that they will try to gain access to the server which is offering that insecure Wi-Fi and start to look for any ports on that server which are actually open for uh, unauthorized access or even allowing access with little or no protection whatsoever. So once they're able to identify such a port which is available for access into the server, from there on out, what they can do is they can perform the next step of the attack, which is called ARP spoofing. ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol. And this protocol is a protocol which binds the IP address of a machine to its MAC address. MAC address is the actual physical address of the machine. So there is a link between the IP it has on a network versus its physical address. Now, ARP spoofing tries to mimic this link and by falsely identifying a machine as a legitimate machine on the network by giving it a fake MAC address and linking it to a valid IP address on the network. Therefore, the server begins to trust that machine as a genuine machine on that network. So this attack allows the attacker to perform what is known as the MITM or man in the middle attack. So then what will happen is, as a man in the middle attack, once the attacker's device has been authenticated as a possible genuine device, on that network, it can then start to sniff the traffic that is flowing between a PAC server and a medical imaging device. So in this case, the first step that has led to the breach was 
the insecure Wi-Fi, which allowed the attackers to start scanning the ports for any uh, poor security or no security at all in the first place. From there on out, it is a set of steps to follow in order to gain access to the server and start sniffing the traffic. The third aspect of uh, the attack vector is known as uh, physical brute force. Now, this is something extremely low tech, but nonetheless, it is extremely effective. Here, what happens is that it will be a misfeasor, of course, and a misfeasor obviously being a legitimate, uh, say, employee or a personnel within a, a hospital or an organization has physical access to the medical imaging device. It could be a technician uh, who is not really happy with the working conditions or not really happy with the organization and wants to get revenge. So he nonetheless is a valid employee. So therefore he has access to a medical imaging device. Now, what will happen is that if this misfeasor has physical access to a medical imaging device, even though maybe the machine itself is locked with a password or an access code, the misfeasor can still go ahead and dismantle the machine and physically steal any storage devices within it, such as disks or memory, which may have any medical imaging data inside it. So that's the easiest way. It's pure theft and nothing else. On the other hand, sometimes these devices have an emergency access code which is needed for rebooting the machine for essential maintenance and for fault identification and fault detection. So it will allow technicians to have emergency access to the machine if they were to enter an emergency access code. Now, once this code is there in a machine, some basic functionalities can be made accessible without requiring any authentication in terms of a password. So in this case, uh, a, a technician, let's say, who is intent on stealing this medical imaging data, they may try to go through the machine by using its emergency access code and they only have access to the basic functionalities. But once they have access to the basic functionalities, they can now inject any other malware into the medical imaging device to gain further access to its other uh, functionalities or even from there to gain access to all the records that it has stored inside it. So this is known as the foot in the door method. So you get the foot in the door to make sure that the door, that the door doesn't close by using its emergency access and from there on you can start injecting your malware and uh, trojan horses etc to gain complete access to the system so these three attack vectors are extremely difficult to manage and extremely difficult to control because they would mean cutting off other essential services as well which cannot which is really not possible so therefore the best is a prevention strategy where what you do is that you stay on the lookout for any suspicious behavior and once you detect any suspicious behavior, you step in to stop that suspicious behavior. There is no other strategy that you can have, which is a proactive approach. It has to be a reactive approach. Now, when you talk about internal attack vectors, now in this case, as I said to you, that the attacker is basically internal to a network. And in this case, what we're going to assume is that the attacker is a legitimate user of the network the attacker has been authenticated to be on the network. So it's not an external player anymore. They're not trying to gain access to the network first and then launch their attack from there. They are already on the network as a legitimate user. And once they are on the network as a legitimate user, then they can perform any of these three attacks. It could be port scanning, it could be traffic analysis or reverse engineering. So let's start off with the first approach, which is called port scanning. And it is a very popular attack vector. So this usually starts off by an attacker, first of all, stealing the login credentials of a valid user or an employee. So once the username and password or any credentials or authentication details of any valid employee uh, of a hospital or a medical organization has been stolen, so that can be used to log on to the network. Now you are into the network as a an authenticated legitimate user so not, nothing wrong about that but once you're there again the approach is to start scanning the server or the host for any open ports and many easily available tools such as nmaps will help anyone to do so so these tools are easily available online you can use these to scan any server to look for any open ports that are open for communication and once such ports are identified 
then in that case, the attacker will start to scan these ports to see what services are actually available on such ports. So in some cases, some ports will only allow for handshaking signals to check for availability of a device, but some ports will be willing to share data. And that data, uh, data could be things like how many machines are connected, where they are located, what are their capabilities, and some other ports will be willing to reveal much more information such as uh, the nature of the server, uh, what are the capabilities of the server, and in particular, I'll talk about one uh, major flaw that has been identified on one of the ports, which is known as the hard bleed vulnerability. So here, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, and this is uh, an encryption approach that is used to establish a secure connection between a server and a client. Now, what happens here is that once this connection has been established, the server and the client have a trust relationship that they trust each other as being authentic machines and whatever they are sending to each other is authentic and genuine information. Now, in this case, once this connection has been established, what the client can do is that the client can essentially fool the server into revealing the entire contents of its RAM. So whatever is in the RAM can be entirely revealed to the client that is asking for this information. And if that happens, it means that in this case, the server is revealing not just the information that the client has asked for, but is also revealing information that was not meant for it. And this is known as the hard bleed vulnerability. And this was a major flaw that was found in the SSL, which is, as I said, an encryption technique that allows for a secure connection between a client and a server. So here, the flaw was that the port which allows for an SSL connection could be fooled into forcing the server to reveal the contents of its entire RAM rather than just the information that the, that the client was asking for. And in this case, if the server has got a few images stored in the RAM, they could easily be dumped onto the client if it asks for it under this vulnerability. So this was a very popular attack vector. This was carried on for a long period of time before it was identified. And then the uh, authority which handles the SSL standard was notified about this vulnerability before they managed to plug this gap. But before this gap was plugged, it led to a lot of data breaches and that involved a lot of medical imaging data also being stolen. The next uh, internal attack is traffic analysis. Now this is also known as a passive attack because in this attack, what usually happens is that obviously all the medical imaging devices are connected to the server via an ethernet and all ethernet switches have something known as a mirror port. A mirror port is a special kind of a port where usually uh, network engineers try to plug into the switch or connect to the switch via this port in order to analyze the data on the network to look for any possible faults. So if you are trying to manage a network in terms of analyzing its traffic or the intensity of the traffic and to see whether all possible nodes are up and running, so any analysis that has to be done on the network by network engineers is usually done by the network engineer connecting to the mirror port of the switch and analyzing the traffic. Now, this mirror port should normally be closed and should only allow for authenticated users to connect to it. However, because of poor deployment and because of, let's say, lax security measures, the mirror port could sometimes be left open. And if it is left open, then in that case, an attacker could connect to the mirror port of the switch and this would allow the attacker to start analyzing any traffic that flows through that switch. And in this analysis, the least that the attacker could do is to simply look at the information and not make any changes. But in a worst case scenario, the attacker could not just analyze this information that is flowing through the switch, but can also inject their own malware in order to target a particular machine on that network. So again, this is an attack which is very easily carried out because the tools to do this, such as Wireshark, are easily available online. So all an attacker has to do is to connect to a switch, analyze its ports to see whether the mirror port is available for connection. And if it is, deploy the Wireshark analysis tool there and start sniffing the traffic. And 
as I said, in, this, in the best case scenario, it is just sniffing the traffic and not making any changes. In the worst case scenario, it could not just be theft, but also modification and changes to the data that is flowing through the switch as well. Uh, the third aspect of internal attacks is reverse engineering. And in reverse engineering, uh, this is an approach which is, again, actually quite low tech, because in reverse engineering, what happens is that you take a finished product and you take it apart to understand how it works. And reverse engineering, believe it or not, is a legally accepted practice. So you can take a competitor's product, you can take it apart, and you can understand the individual components that are there and try to understand its functioning. And, and you can use that information to refine or improve your own product. And this is a legally accepted practice. Similar to this, what can happen in medical imaging systems is that once an attacker has gained access to a medical imaging device via any of the techniques that we have just discussed, what they can find is that usually these medical imaging devices are run or managed using open source software. And that is simply because of the fact that it allows third party manufacturers and third party uh, maintenance uh, organizations to perform maintenance on the medical imaging devices. So you don't really have to go to the original manufacturer to perform any updates, et cetera. But once you have a medical imaging device which has got open source software which is running that device, it means that an attacker, once they have gained access to the device, can easily get hold of the original source code that is running the device, make any changes to the open source, and have the medical imaging device run as they see fit. So it could be as simple a case of modifying the open source code such that whenever the medical imaging device generates any data, it is not just sent to the PAC server, which is controlling that device, but a copy of that medical image is also sent to the attacker. And in this case now, because the change has been made in the source code itself, it is almost impossible to detect that this has been the case because there is no attack happening. Network analysis uh, by cyber forensic experts will not be able to detect this attack because there is no suspicious activity on the network itself. It is now the source code, which is inside the medical imaging device that has actually been modified and changed such that it also sends a copy of the medical image to the attacker as well, in addition to the server where it is supposed to be archived. So this is a very potent attack. This is a very serious attack, and it is very difficult to detect. So when you come to the protection mechanisms now, and let's take a look at whether some of the protection mechanisms that are in use today uh, are effective in preventing any of the attacks that we have just seen. So these are some of the approaches that uh, are used in order to protect. So you can have either one of them or a combination of these in order to protect medical images. So you can start off by encryption and watermarking. You can ensure physical and network security, and you also have something called system hardening. And obviously all the legal frameworks always publish a security guidance that organizations must follow in order to ensure medical images are protected. So when you talk about encryption, uh, encryption methods uh, basically are applied on the data before it is transmitted or archived. So as soon as the medical imaging data is obtained, uh, it is immediately encrypted. And once it is encrypted, usually it is transferred from the medical imaging device to the packs and there is via a VPN. And obviously we know that with a VPN connection, everything is encrypted. Uh, by default, many of the imaging devices today are all HTTPS based. And you know that HTTPS is a secure protocol which is used by, on web browsers uh, for establishing a secure connection between a client and a server. Also, some manufacturers are now installing what is known as a hardware security module, which controls or rather protects not just the source code inside these medical imaging devices, but it also protects uh, all the images that are stored or archived within that medical imaging device as well. Uh, however, the problem is that it is usually an add-on feature. It is, it is not there by default. And therefore, if 
a medical imaging device does not have an HSM, then it is now the responsibility of the hospital or the organization that is using the medical imaging device to have mechanisms enforced that will protect the device and any images contained therein. So this is one of the uh, default approaches, even if you, if you want to call it that, one of the default approaches that is used to protect medical images. However, by itself, it is not enough. So an add-on approach is to do with watermarking as well. So I'm sure some of you may be aware of watermarking as a technique. Uh, watermarking in medical images in particular is used for authentication and for content integrity. This basically means that uh, if an image is watermarked, it is indicated, or rather that watermark is an indicator of the authenticity of that image, claiming thereby that the image has not been modified or changed in any way. Uh, content integrity is again an issue where you want to ensure that there have been no unauthorized changes to the image. So both of them are a requirement. So first of all, you, you may want to trust the image as being genuine, as in it has been sent by a genuine medical imaging device. It has been sent by a genuine employee of a, of a hospital or an, or an organization. And then the image itself is authentic in the sense that there has been no untoward changes that have been made to now, usually, authentication is done using robust watermarking. So because you want to have a watermark which is as robust as possible, so that it can always be authenticated as being genuine and as being sent from an authentic organization. Whereas any content integrity is protected using fragile watermarks, where you want to make sure that if there are any minor changes whatsoever in the image itself, then those are actually clearly indicated by a watermark which will be disturbed because it is fragile in nature. So therefore, you have to use a mix of the two. The robust aspect of the watermark is used for authentication, whereas the fragile aspect of the watermark is used for content integrity. So when you mix the two, you end up with something called as hybrid watermarks. And these are the most popularly used approaches when it comes to medical images. The problem with medical images themselves is that they are usually left uncompressed. So they are never either in a JPEG or a PNG format. They are usually left in a bitmap. So the, the, the DICOM standard is usually an uncompressed image format where the information is saved as is. No compression is performed on it. So once we talk about images which, has, which have not been compressed, therefore we're talking about protecting those images in something known as the pixel domain or the spatial domain. Because now what we have is information contained in every single pixel. And we have to think about how can that information within every pixel be protected. Uh, now this raises an issue. This is an, an issue because whenever you talk about watermarking, what we understand is that watermarking as a technique leads to changes within the image itself. And that is something that may not be acceptable for medical images because even a tiny bit of information in a medical image may carry critical information. So if you make any changes to that critical piece of information contained in an image by using watermarking, then that critical information is lost as a result of watermarking and therefore watermarking as a technique has actually turned out to be detrimental rather than beneficial for protecting a medical image. So it is important that any watermarking techniques that are applied on medical images should be careful that no critical information is either lost or overwritten. So one of the things that we have to consider in this case then is that usually in a medical image, there are two clear sections. One is the actual information that is to be used for the diagnostic process. And usually there is quite a bit of an area which is a dark or a plain black background which has got no meaningful information inside it. So researchers who perform watermarking on medical images usually tend to divide medical images into two clear regions. One is known as the ROI region or the region of interest. And the surrounding area is known as the non-ROI which is the non uh, so to say region of interest. This does, not, this does not have any diagnostic information inside it. Whereas 
uh, this region in the middle obviously has all the diagnostic information inside it. So the idea being that any information within the ROI has to be maintained as such, whereas all of the surrounding information, which is black or dark in color, does not have any diagnostic information. So we can we are more flexible to do or make any changes to this surrounding region rather than in the ROI. So when we have this information with us, what we can have as a possible watermarking approach is as shown here. So you start off with the patient information. This could be things like the name, the age, uh, the diagnostic history of the patient, etc. And that is critical information because that will link the patient to the diagnostic image. So we take the patient information and we encrypt it first. So once it has been encrypted, what we would do now is that because we are going to make sure that the ROI region always stays protected, and this is the actual region that has the diagnostic information of this patient, therefore there has to be a link between the diagnostic information within the ROI and the patient. So therefore, the patient information that we have ended up encrypting here will actually be embedded in the least significant bit of the information or the pixels that are contained within the ROI. Now, obviously, you can say, well, if you're changing the least significant bit and of every pixel within the ROI with the patient information, you are making changes to this information here. And, and you just now mentioned that this should not be changed. Yes, that's true. This should not be changed. So the way to do that is that once we go ahead and make changes in the least significant bit of all the pixels within the ROI, the original bit information that we had actually changed here is extracted before the embedding is done. And that is known as the recovery information because this will allow us to get back to the original bit information of the ROI. So that is extracted before the embedding is done. And we save that separately. And once we have saved that separately, then the embedding of the patient information is performed in the ROI. Now the original information that we had extracted from here within the ROI is encrypted using a different encryption algorithm. And then this encrypted information, which is the original LSP information, is now embedded in the non-ROI region. So the reverse, as would happen now, is that the non-ROI region, which has got the recovery information, is decrypted first. And once it has been decrypted, the recovery information is obtained. And once the recovery information is obtained, it is, it is saved at a, at, a, at a temporary location. Then the LSP information from the ROI is extracted. And we know that the information that we have extracted from the ROI at the moment is the encrypted information. So once it is de decrypted, it is then saved in yet another temporary location. And the recovery information is put back into the ROI to regain the original ROI information in terms of the pixel values. Now this decrypted information that has been saved at another temporary location is now decrypted to get back the patient information. So this is how a link is made between the patient information and their corresponding diagnostic image. Now this turns out to be a pretty effective approach to protect uh, patient confidentiality in terms of their diagnostic information. However, we have not yet taken into account the fact as to that the image can still be stolen. So if it is stolen, we still have a problem, even though the information will not be revealed from the image because the information has been encrypted. But because there has been a breach in the medical imaging system or the medical imaging infrastructure, that itself is a problem. And that has to be handled as well. And that is looked at later. So this is the exact approach that we have to have in order to make sure that the images are not even stolen or breached in the first instance. So what we have to make sure is that whenever there is a connection of a medical device to a PAC server or a third party server or other clients on the network, then they are very much likely to suffer from, uh, again, the man in the middle attack or the MITM attack. So as, you, as I've shown you in the diagram here, what really happens is if there is, this is the authentic communication between a user and let's say a record of medical images, then the man in the middle attack, what they would do is they would try to reroute this communication that is happening between uh, a legitimate user and the archive to their own machine. 
thereby even though the victim here will not be able to sense any difference in how they are communicating with the archive nonetheless the man in the middle is able to glean or obtain all the information that is being sent out or being or being exchanged between the client and this archive here so one way to prevent this from happening is that the DICOM imaging standard in itself has got something known as a node authentication field within its header. So the file header for DICOM images always has a field which will tell you whether it is it has authenticating a node from where the image is being transmitted or received. And this is known as the application entity title or the AE title. So this is the actual field in the header of DICOM images which is used by components or entities which are exchanging DICOM images between each other. So what really happens is that this title and or rather this field, it always tries to establish a link between the IP address, which is sending a DICOM image and the port number that that machine has been allocated on the network. So this is an information which is usually maintained by the PAC server itself. So the PAC server, sorry, uh, sorry, so the PAC server will always have a table wherein there will be a link between the IP address allocated to a machine or a medical imaging device on a network and the port it is operating from. And this information is saved in the AE title. So whenever a device receives a DICOM image or is ready to transmit a DICOM image, it will first make a check as to the destinations link between its port number and the address and if it is matched then this information is stored in the AE title upon receiving the DICOM image the recipient will check the AE title and cross check with the server to see whether the information in the AE title matches that which is stored on the server or not so obviously in this case if the images or the transmissions was being rerouted as a result of the man in the middle attack obviously this would not tally up with the information stored in the server and therefore that transmission would actually be rejected but the problem here is that this is a piece of information that is only stored within a dicom image and we cannot just rely on this ae title being a preventive measure for man in the middle attack because in the man in the middle attack the attacks have been getting more and more sophisticated and one of the easiest ways to defeat the AE title check is to again perform ARP spoofing, where again, you try to mimic the table information that is stored in the server with regards to the connection between an IP port and IP address and a port. So it can be very easily defeated if you are able to spoof or fool the recipient by making it point to a different table other than the one that is stored in the server. So you can actually fool the recipient into believing that it is looking at a legitimate table, which has a link between the IP address and the port number. And once you're able to fool a recipient into believing that it is looking at a genuine table rather than a manipulated table, that is known as ARP spoofing. And once you have this kind of an attack, the recipient will accept whatever DICOM images are being transmitted or received. And it will simply trust whatever information is present in the AE title. So one of the interim solutions to avoid this is to create static ARP entries. Usually, whenever a machine enters a network, it is given it a, a, a dynamic IP address. When it leaves, the IP address is taken away. So usually, the server maintains a pool of IP addresses which are allocated and deallocated to machines as and when they arrive and leave the system. To avoid this kind of ARP spoofing, one of the easiest ways is that the server will maintain a static table wherein it will have a set of static IP addresses given to machines along with their port numbers and this will not change so once the, this table is not going to change and it is not going to be dynamically updated therefore now any spoofing attacks can be prevented because then the spoofer or the attacker cannot fool the system into looking at a dynamic table because the client or the victim already knows that it only has to look at a fixed table which could be local to it so it doesn't even have to go to the server to look at the latest table or the most updated table because the server has already decided 
that this is a static table which will not change for the life of the network. And therefore, that uh, table could be stored even locally. And therefore, the client can only look at the static ARP entries that it has. And if there are any communications that are happening from any newer IP addresses, then those communications will be rejected. So this is basically saying that we establish a trust relationship within a network because all devices know exactly which IP addresses and which port numbers are other nodes in the network communicating from. So there is no dynamic addition or deletion of nodes in a network. So if you avoid trust relationships, then in this case, there is a possibility that AR spoofing attacks could be prevented to some extent. However, a long-term solution to this is that you install a detection tool to track and detect and identify if there are any possible AR spoofing attacks that are possibly happening. However, a third approach is that you can try and improve the node authentication method that is being used within DICOM images and try to make it more resilient such that it does not blindly accept the authentication that is being embedded in the field itself, but try to additionally go and check that node authentication information with some other entity in the network, which is a little bit more protected. Now, this is again uh, a security measure which is quite low tech uh, in its approach. So this is just being saying that you have to have physical safeguards. So therefore, you have to make sure that you have policies and procedures uh, in terms of physical protection of the medical data. So things like you have to have intrusion detections, you have to have proper authentication and authorization. Uh, you have to make sure that only authorized personnel within an organization, uh, even though they are legitimate employees of the organization, but still have uh, to have an additional level of authentication before they can actually access any medical data. Uh, so within the UK, you have got uh, actually the law, the, G the GDPR law, which says that these are the physical safeguards that are a must, that are necessary to protect medical imaging data. Uh, in the US, also the HIPAA has a very clear framework as to what the health services must follow in terms of ensuring physical security for medical imaging data. Uh, I have not been through the details of the personal data protection bill that was tabled in India, but uh, I'm fairly certain that it will also have a very clear set of framework that will be laid down in terms of how to have physical protection of any repositories that store medical imaging data. So if you look at this. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Can yeah. we take a few questions, sir? You want to take a question now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can take a few questions in between. Then after the last end, we can take few, sir. Well, if you want, because I think I probably have got about 10 more slides to go. So okay. up to you. Yeah, that's up to you, sir. We will take at the end, sir. Okay, okay. Let me just finish it off in about five to seven minutes. No, no issue, sir. Have the last, we'll have the last 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay, sir. Okay, right. So if you see here, in this, in this diagram here, when you talk about the physical safeguards, again, as you can see, I have got this from the HIPAA Academy from the US. And if you look at this layer here, it says that you have to have at least these four aspects under physical safeguards. So you have to make sure that access controls are in place. Workstations have to have appropriate security measures in place. Uh, Personnel should have proper authorization when working on a workstation. And all device and media should also have proper controls in order to make sure that who has or who hasn't got access to these uh, medical devices. Finally, system hardening. Uh, system hardening will use all of these approaches or a mix of these approaches. So you'll have to have firewalls in place. Uh, packets have to be filtered, especially if they're coming from outside the network. Uh, obviously, anti-malware, anti-spyware anti are there. In many systems, shortcuts are disabled because shortcuts uh, are the keys uh, used on the keyboard, and they can also be used to launch and deploy certain malware. So shortcuts are usually disabled. Updates should not be pull-based, but push-based. So you have to push an update. You should not depend upon the device or the client itself to pull an update, because usually they don't. Um, auditing has to be very extensive. So you have to have a very clear trace of where the data is originating from, where it is going, uh, and who else uh, 
is going to access this data. And obviously, all of the above can also be applied in terms of hardening not just the system, but the server, the database, and the application itself that is going to access that medical imaging data. <clears throat> so the above six are the hardening steps, and you can use a combination of these on the server, on the database, on the application, and on the medical, medical imaging device itself as well. Let me quickly take you through some of the case studies very quickly. So this was a big, big data breach in the UK in 2017. It, it, it was called WannaCry. This was ransomware, and it infected about 200,000 computers. Uh, I think it was around the world, I believe. Uh, and then uh, the damage WannaCry actually led to was up, up people are estimating up to billions of dollars. Uh, in the UK, it actually hit the National Health Service hospitals uh, and the medical imaging devices were brought down and all the computer systems that were used in the NHS were locked up as a result of the ransomware. Uh, as you can see here, up to 70,000 devices were actually affected, including MRI scanners. People were actually turned away from hospitals uh, if they had emergency surgery being scheduled as well as a result of this attack. So people were literally being brought in ambulances and then being turned away saying that uh, medical imaging devices were down as a result of this attack, so surgeries will not proceed. So this was a major catastrophe in terms of a data breach happening in the UK in 2017. Uh, it had to do with particularly Windows systems because most of the computer systems used in the NHS in, the, in England are all Windows based. And this had to do with the fact that some of the Windows systems were not updated. And the attack was particularly targeted at Windows 8, uh, Windows 2003 server systems. Windows XP systems were impacted as well, but usually Windows XP systems crashed as a result of this attack rather than uh, were actually a victim of the attack. Uh, this attack was actually done via the SMB network protocol. This is the protocol that allows access to uh, different resources on a network. So if you want to access a files, printers, serial ports, uh, and other serial devices on a network, you can do so via the SMB. So what really happened was that the ransomware was dropped on the network as a dropper. And the dropper basically is a Trojan horse. So it contained inside it, uh, of course, the malware that was supposed to uh, actually detect uh, any weaknesses or vulnerabilities in the system. Then it had the encryption software itself that performed the encryption as part of the ransomware. It had the decryption keys as well in it. And also a copy of the Tor browser, which allows for encrypted communication between a client and a server. Uh, what was the modus operandi in this case was that the uh, dropper or the ransomware tried to actually access a hard-coded non-existent URL. And if it failed to do that, it would go ahead and encrypt all the files on the victim's machine. So. It was as simple as that. It was a very primitive and a very uh, sort of, say, amateurish kind of an attack, wherein all it did was look at and try to access a non-existent URL. If it didn't exist, go ahead and encrypt everything on that system. So it was very easily defeated by uh, an amateur hacker. What, and what he did was he simply registered that non-existent URL. And as soon as the URL began to exist, and once the code tried to exist, uh, access that URL, and the access was found because the URL began to exist, it failed. It simply did not go ahead with the encryption. So it was easily defeated, but before it could be defeated, it led to loss of billions of dollars. This was also a fairly recent case in 2018 in Norway. And this actually led to the patient information of almost half of the population of Norway being revealed. And this was a highly professional and targeted attack. Uh, people believe that this was an insider attack, so there was probably a clandestine user or a misfeasor uh, who had got legitimate access to the network and who led to the medical records and the images of half of the patients in Norway being released. Uh, so it released two databases, the patient records in themselves and any of the interaction that the health service had with the Norway's armed forces. So any upcoming military operations and any strategies of that upcoming military operation that was stored on the database was also released. Uh, the main reason for this attack and the reason why it was so devastating was the large attack surface. The attack vector in this case was something which is called BOD, or we call it as bring your own device. Uh, 
the health systems uh, that are normally in place in Norway and also in the UK is that usually the consultants, the physicians and the doctors are not usually employed by the hospital. They, uh, they are considered to be third party entities of a hospital. They come to a hospital, they meet their patients, they perform the diagnostic process, they perform any, they give any clinical advice and they leave because they also work at other hospitals. So because they're not directly employed by the hospitals but act as consultants, so what they do is that in order to improve their productivity, they sometimes tend to use their own personal devices for the diagnostic process. So they can be using their own phones, their own tablets, their own laptops, which means that they are not as secure as a device or a system or a computer that is actually uh, installed within the network of the hospital. So because these devices were unsecured, therefore they did not have the best security practices in force within them. And this meant that there was a huge gap in security between the uh, security mechanisms that have been enforced by the hospital and any security that was there on these personal devices of the physicians and the consultants. So therefore, this led to a large attack surface being made available to the attackers. Uh, the investigation that was carried out also revealed that it could possibly may have been uh, a malicious insider, it could have been a careless worker, it could have been a disgruntled employee, and it could have been simply a careless third party. But it could not be denied that the fact was that the large attack surface made this attack really devastating, leading to half of the Norway's population's medical information being revealed that included medical images as well. If you look at this graph here, you can see that it's the end user which usually leads to the maximum number of vulnerabilities uh, that are presented to an attacker. So usually it is not anyone else, for example, the manager, the developers, the doctors and nurses, they are not not usually the source of these uh, attack surfaces uh, that are usually presented. It is usually the end user, uh, which are more likely to be the case where they would present an attack surface that could easily be breached. In India, this was a fairly recent case in India, 2020 actually. I think it was in January 2020. Uh, it was discovered by Greenborn Networks in Germany. Uh, and what they found was that 107 million images of Indian patients was revealed uh, to attackers. And that included details about the patients themselves. And the hospitals that were in, impacted by this breach were some really premier organizations, such as the Breach Candy Hospital in Mumbai, that was impacted by this uh, attack as well. And the reason was very simple. Their PAC system was unsecured. There was no access control. There was no encryption. And they had no security measures in place to protect either the images or the corresponding patient information. So actually, when they were informed of this, the Breach Candy Hospital, they said that they never even expected that the medical imaging data and the record that they had on their servers would ever be breached. So they thought that they never had accounted for this possibility that this could ever happen. And it's a very sad state of affairs that when you don't even think about security measures that must be in place. Uh, so as per the green bond, what they said was that none of the security protocols were followed and the PAC server's URL was available on the internet without any authentication. So as long as you had the URL of the PAC server, you could simply get into the server and download any data you wanted. So as a result of this report, what Greenbone said that there are actually 97 vulnerable systems in India and none of these systems had any security measures in place. And it says that almost 100% of the systems that they had studied allow full access to related images, which is a very scary scenario. So the takeaway that we can have as a result is that data breaches in healthcare are actually double in terms of the cost that it incurs when compared to data breaches of other kinds of data. So for example, financial data, credit card data, all of that. So that is usually half of the cost that is incurred when medical imaging data is actually breached. As you can see here, it goes up to $6.45 million annually. Okay, So it is the most breached industry as has been confirmed by another security agency called Security Scorecard. They say that it is the most vulnerable data and is the most widely breached data of all. Okay, However, we don't see the significance of this. What we are doing is that we are adding security to these physical systems as an afterthought not as a main strategy, but as an afterthought. 
Sometimes you completely overlook this, as in the case of the data, the data breach that happened in India recently. The legal protection, even though we have the HIPAA in the US, the GDPR in the EU, and now there's a DPA coming up in India, but it still is going to be ineffective because it's all simply being catch up, nothing much. And the conventional techniques that we have just had a look at is really not fit for purpose because it is just uh, simply plugging in the gaps. Uh, therefore, what we need is a strategy where we come up with a secure system from the ground up. So when we come up with a cyber physical system, we start up by devising security mechanisms from the ground up rather than having it as an afterthought. So this is the key takeaway that we can have here. We have identified that these are the issues uh, that we take place. So actually in Buckingham, we are doing a number of research projects which try to solve this problem by including biometrics to authenticate users. So this is one of the most effective methods to authenticate users. So we are uh, doing this research as a part of a European project. We are also making use of context aware and adoptive biometric systems where you have the option of choosing the best biometric approach to use to authenticate a user. Uh, we are using decision support systems uh, for medical diagnostic decision making. So we have got the decisions that need to be made for a diagnostic process based upon support system, which will identify the best approach to take. And we're also taking a look at, because now most of the medical images are now being transmitted via cloud-based approaches. Therefore, that is another avenue for security that must be researched about. And therefore, uh, we are looking at some versatile and scalable uh, encryption techniques to ensure privacy and security in cloud platforms. So uh, these are some of the uh, most cutting edge research techniques that are being looked at. Uh, in the University of Buckingham. Uh, I think that's pretty much, so thank you very much. Uh, right, I am ready for questions and answers. Dr. Vishal. I request to participants, instead of writing chat window, you can unmute your mic and ask the question from the sir. I request to participant to unmute your mic and ask the question from the sir, instead of writing a chat window, you can do that. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, I actually wanted to know something about the HIPAA and uh, HIPAA. Yes, yes. Please go on. I'm listening. Uh, yes. So, what uh, what is its purpose, and does it make the data secure? So, HIPAA is a legal framework. Let me see if I have, I don't have much information here because I was not focusing on the legal aspect of it. But as you can see here, that the HIPAA is a legal framework that was signed into law in the US in 1996. And what the HIPAA does is, if you look at this particular, uh, let's see if I can get there very quickly. Uh, So this is, this is what the HIPAA has actually specified in terms of protecting medical imaging data. So it says that you have to have uh, protections and safeguards in place to protect medical imaging data, not just in terms of physical protection, but also have to have appropriate measures in place to protect medical imaging data when it is acquired, when it is transmitted, when it is archived and it is displayed. So at every step of the medical imaging process, you have to make sure that there are appropriate safeguards in place. And these safeguards are the responsibility of not just uh, the hospital, but also the legal responsibility of the consultant, the technician, uh, the network maintenance entity, and even the uh, manufacturer of the medical imaging device. So essentially saying the entire circle which involves the medical imaging, uh, so to say, workflow, right from acquiring to archival to storage, are all under the purview of HIPAA. That means that it is saying that at every step that you perform, you have to make sure that there are some legal responsibilities that you must have in order to protect this data. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Sir, so do we have uh, some of this kind other than HIPAA? So as I said, I mean, uh, in the UK, you have got something called as the GDPR, which is a very strict law with regards to the privacy and safety of uh, medical imaging data. 
uh, and it is it, it is it is a law which is very broad in its approach because GDPR covers the entire European Union. It covers the UK. It covers a, a certain portion of Scandinavian countries as well. It is a law which is very broad in its geographical reach. Uh, as I said to you, in 2019, India tabled the Data Protection Bill. Uh, it is still, uh, I think, it is still being ratified. It has not yet been put into a law. But uh, India also, the, uh, this law should be in place in the near future. Almost every country in the world has a legal framework that they are trying to come up with in order to specifically protect uh, medical images. I only picked up three cases for the UK, the US, and India. I'm sure that you will find different uh, frameworks in almost every country of the world. Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Arti, can you please unmute your mic? Dr. Arti, you please ask your question. Dr. Harshita. You can just unmute your mic and ask the question. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, you yes, are. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon. Uh, sir, my question was, uh, as US and UK are outsourcing their medical data for transcriptions to India, is that not to they oppose any kind of threat to medical imaging? Yes, obviously. Good question. Yes, it does. So whenever medical imaging data is outsourced, it means that you are involving a third party uh, into the whole medical imaging, diagnostic, uh, and archival process. And this means that the legal responsibility will become quite tricky. Now, one of the ways that this has been handled is that, for example, in the context of the UK, uh, the GDPR law ensures that if the data belongs to a European citizen or a UK citizen, it should reside on a server which is located in the EU or UK. So this is a legal requirement that has just been ensured that data which belongs to a European citizen or a UK citizen will never ever be transmitted or stored or archived outside the geographical boundaries of UK or EU. So this is uh, this is something which has been put in as a requirement now. That can't happen anymore. Uh, that means even if the data is uh, out, servers remain of it, UK or European. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat your question because there's a bit of a disturbance. Uh, that means if yeah. even the data is outsourced to. Still, this uh, data remains in the circles of UK or European country. Yes. So, the, so that means the yes. So that means the data is essentially not outsourced, as in it will not be located on a server or any machine outside the geographical boundaries of UK or EU. If there is a third-party consultant that needs to come in, or a third-party entity that needs to come in, they will have to log into a server that is located within UK or EU in order to uh, provide any services. Okay, thank you so much, sir. You're, you're welcome. Dr. Bellu Swami, sir, would you like to ask? You have written something in the chat window. Dr. Jitender Kumar, you have asked two, three questions. Can you unmute your mic? So there is a one question. Suggest some standard encryption algorithms for medical images. There are no standard algorithms for medical images as such. Any standard encryption algorithm can be used for performing encryption on medical images. Uh, and that is simply because of the fact that if any proprietary encryption algorithms were used, then it would mean that uh, it would not be that widely deployed or be used. Therefore, not everyone would be able to decrypt it. Using standard encryption algorithms 
means that it is a broadly accepted standard, which means that uh, if the medical image was to be transmitted to, let's say, a consultant on the other side of the world for diagnostic purposes, then it could still be easily decrypted. So it is always beneficial to make use of a standard encryption algorithm rather than using a proprietary one. Oh, thank you, sir. And now, Dr. Consequence, sir, is available. You can please ask, sir. You are not audible, sir. Dr. Veluswami, sir, you are not audible. I think there is some problem in your mic. You can write in the chat, sir. One participant would like to ask, uh, suggest some interesting books or a websites to learn fundamentals and research opportunities in medical imaging. So uh, I am not sure whether I included some of the, but if you look at the bottom of some of the slides, I have got some links that I have provided. And uh, these links would provide you with quite a bit of uh, interesting information that you can start to learn about uh, these books. Uh, let me just uh, try to mention quickly a book uh, that I may uh, have, which is quite nice. Uh, so I referred to some of the materials, which is to do with uh, Dr. Vishal, if you can just quickly put this down as a chat message. Uh, one of the books is called Cryptographic and Information Security. Cryptographic. And and information security, security approaches for images and videos that's the name cryptographic and information security approaches for, for images and videos and uh, this is a book which has been edited by dr s rama krishnan rama dr s rama krishnan And this is a book by uh, Francis. And uh, this is a fairly new book. It was published in 2019. And, uh, so, uh, this book is quite relevant from the point of view of latest technologies that are available for uh, protecting medical images. Have you got the Dr. Vishal? Yes, sir. I have written in the chat book. OK. Some spelling mistake, or so I request to participants to adjust with the spelling. Yeah, so it's I, I'll repeat cryptographic and information and information security. security approaches for images and videos by Dr. S. Ramakrishna by Taylor and Francis. Uh, it's a uh, uh, Ramakrishnan, so that's R Ramakrishnan. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. R A M A K R I S H N A N. Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. Does anyone have any question? Uh, there is one more question. Can we use blockchain technology in securing medical imaging? Please repeat the Dr. Vishal. Sir, can we use blockchain technology in securing medical imaging? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure whether a blockchain technology is a, a security mechanism. I, I think that blockchain is a sort of a workflow optimization technique rather than a security enforcement technique. Uh, I won't be able to give you a definite answer on this because I am not really working in the area of blockchain technology. But as far as my understanding goes, I think it is a workflow management technique rather than a security enforcement technique. So I'm, 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 I won't be able to give you a definite answer on that. I'm sorry. Any other one? Uh, I would like to ask one more question. Uh, do you think that the latest technologies, when we talk about AI, IoT, and other things, so will they be improving the security for the medical purposes, or they can be changes to the medical data? So, with reducing these newer technologies, such as uh, using deep learning techniques and uh, computer vision-based techniques for diagnostic processes the requirement for security still doesn't go away. They are just techniques which are improving the diagnostic accuracy and the performance of the diagnostic process. But that means that the underlying security issues still remain. 
And in fact, it becomes a lot more important because you are making the image flow through a lot more steps in the workflow. Therefore, it means that you have to have uh, security mechanisms in place that are deployed at every step of the workflow. So in, in fact, it makes the issue of ensuring the protection and security of medical images all the more important if you're going to use newer technology. So that is the reason why I said that with the way we are developing now with medical diagnostic techniques, using stopgap solutions is not really the way to go. So in fact, if you start and coming up with solutions which are designed for protection and security from the ground, you will have a much more stronger solution rather than having stopgap solutions. So when we talk about HIPAA, like I just came across that they use FCC standard for encryption and decryption, right? So uh, what if someone gets access to those NCC codes? So will it be possible to alter the images and other data which are available? Uh, can you please repeat the question? I, I couldn't get the initial part of your question. Uh, just going through the HIPAA thing, uh, I came across they are using NCC standard for encryption and decryption. Yeah. And if by chance I get those, I mean, the coding mechanism, if I get so, will, will it be possible to uh, kindly distort the images, particularly other than the data? So in general, when you talk about an encryption technique, the encryption technique is a standard, which means that we understand how the encryption technique actually works. But the encryption keys that are actually used to encrypt they are the ones that are usually kept secret and are only shared between trusted users. So even if you do know what is the encryption algorithm, it does not mean that you will be able to decrypt the data because the key itself is not revealed to you. So that is the reason why I was saying that using standard algorithms is a preferred method because people understand how these algorithms work. But if you are not a trusted uh, user or a trusted uh, party in that encrypted communication, then because you would not know the key that was used to encrypt the data, therefore you will not be able to decrypt it. So even if the standard algorithm is known, such as that one that has been mentioned in HIPAA, it does not mean that you will be able to decrypt the data because you still do not have the keys needed to decrypt the data. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I'll share the CRC link with the participants. If you would like, very good, Dr. Vishal. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. That's very good. Thank you. I think that is an edited book by Dr. S. Ramakrishnan. Yes. yes. Yes, sir. I have shared with the participants. Thank you very much. The book from that link, sir. Thank you very much. So, if anyone may I ask the last question, question, please? Yes. May I ask please? the last question? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, so, it was a very nice presentation and. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't, you know, I am since I'm from a science background, so I may not know the technicality of the whole computer cybersecurity system. I understand. I have just one question. Like yeah. you work in UK and uh, and in, in Indian scenario, if you try to compare mainly the auditing system, because HIPAA is also, you know, we have to comply with the auditing system. So can you give us some idea about how this auditing system works in UK? And if you have some idea about Indian context, like how rigorous we are, because I work in a medical institution. So I see things which are not, you know, actually in the way, but can you give us some idea like how this auditing system of this whole uh, cybersecurity works over there? and how frequent it is, uh, what are the improvements can be done in terms of Indian hospital system? So uh, that's a very good question. And uh, in terms of the auditing process, I mean, there's a whole organizational change that has to happen in India because at the moment, uh, the entire uh, diagnostic process in India is uh, mainly a mix of uh, paper-based or physical auditing as well as uh, E or digital. Uh, difference that you will find in some of the medical systems in India and those being used, to say, for example, in the UK and the US is that, for example, in the context of the UK, the entire auditing process has now been digitized. So from the point that you enroll into a medical system where you have a unique identity, a unique ID number, from a patient to consultants, so even the consultants, they are authenticated not just by uh, their own uh, digital IDs, but they're also authenticated using biometrics. So for example, whenever a consultant is to 
be a patient, uh, the consultant will first have to log on to a system using their biometric details, such as their face recognition or their thumbprints. So the thumbprint, as it has been registered, leaves an audit trace because the thumbprint will indicate that this is a legitimate consultant and they have been authorized to deal with this patient. Similarly, the patients they have a unique ID. So the NHS, which is the National Health Service in the UK, it main, maintains a countrywide database of their patients, and every patient in that database have a unique ID. So no matter where they are in the UK, no matter which hospital they go to, their database is still the same. Therefore, it means that if they log on to the system to see their data, or to look at their prescriptions or their past records, it is all done via that unique ID. And whenever you log on using the unique ID, it leaves an audit trace behind. So whether it's consultants, whether it's uh, the patients, whether it's the technicians, all of them have been identified in that database using a unique ID, which has been created using a combination of their personal details as well as their biometrics. So therefore, whenever you log on, all of these details are checked, verified, and all of your activity is tracked and monitored on the basis of that ID. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, so just just to add, just to get in position, like, yeah, that's a really very good, you know, a uh, centralized system uh, because you can access, you can log into a common website or some database, and then you can in any hospital you are there, and a patient comes from different. Hospitals, you can access the whole information. So, so yes. as far as it is concerned, I think because it involves private as well as government sector, so uh, so I think that according to you, maybe it's a good suggestion that there is a common database uh, is available in terms of centralized system in India because one patient goes to other place, so it is easy rather than taking a hard copy on anything, you can you know access the whole information. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Absolutely. So the thing is, having a mix of paper-based and digital information makes it very difficult to have all the information available in one place. Uh, the context of the UK, nothing is paper-based. Everything is digitized. The prescription is digitized. Your diagnostic information, your personal details, everything is digitized. So that allows for everything to be stored on a single centralized database, which means that you can access this information all over the country in any hospital you go to. Thank you. If you have an, uh, if you don't have any questions on the participant side, that you can wind up the session. Can you please confirm in the chat window if you don't have any questions? I just take the availability of photo, sir. Yeah, Dr. Vishal. Yes, sir. I'm there. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, can you show me your first screen? Okay, sure. Definitely. Slide show more. So yes, show yeah, more. definitely. 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 Yeah, that's all. So, Dr. Vishal, thank you so much. For My pleasure. Having thank delivered you. such an exhaustive lecture. I, I was thinking that I was sitting in a class where a research material related to medical image processing, vulnerabilities, different type of threats, different dimensions of the threat, possible mechanism using which they can they can be connected and related issues to our discussion. It was a wonderful session and thank you so much for having accepted my request of time out of your busy schedule of examination of their activities at the university and uh, showed your uh, valuable input with the participants. I'm sure these inputs will be of immense use to one and all. And uh, even uh, I, I didn't have this background, but I found it that so Thank you so much, Dr. It was my pleasure uh, presenting this to you. My pleasure. And I'll be more than happy if I have the time again to do so all over again. Thank you very much. Yes. And I hope I didn't bore you too much. No, no, it, it, it was very really interesting, very interesting, uh, and uh, take care, take care, because everywhere the problem is, and we all have to come to live with COVID, with uh, precaution, with some guideline, uh, with some new uh, normals of the life. So take care. Absolutely.
take care for your family and you uh, know thank you very much and you take care of yourself as well and uh, all the best take care thank you, thank you. Okay, Dr. Vishal, I think you can wind yeah. up. Yeah, no, I'm winding up the session for today, sir. So yeah. we will be, we will meet all the participants to on tomorrow at uh, 10.45 so that we can start the session at 11 a.m. sharp. Yeah.